Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Lynn Fries in Geneva. In part one of this report on global value chains, we looked into how in sector after sector, a handful of firms now dominate global production in the world economy. We also looked into what developing countries prioritized when negotiating the Doha development agenda. In this segment, we put the two threads together. Here to continue our conversation is Faisal Ismail. Ambassador Ismail served as South Africa's permanent representative to the World Trade Organization from 2002 through the end of June this year. While at the WTO, he authored two books, Mainstreaming Development in the WTO and Reforming the WTO. He's currently writing a book on South Africa's trade policy from apartheid rule to its new democracy. Ambassador Ismail joins us in Geneva. Faisal, welcome. Welcome to you too. Before getting into a question on global value chains, uh, for viewers who may not have seen part one, I'll, I'll just repeat a point that was made, that what shapes these global value chains are the lead firms. That not only have, uh, has there been tr tremendous industrial concentration among the lead, lead firms, but because of this deepening interaction between the lead firms and their supplier, we've seen suppliers, there's been a deepening of concentration throughout the value chain in the, in the first tier suppliers and even uh, down to the second, third tier supplier. So, for example, on the taking the sector of the large commercial aircraft that you used in part one, the, at the apex of the global value chain are the two lead firms, Boeing and Airbus. But under them, there's a deepening of, con of, of concentration in their suppliers uh, being that's been shaped. So, for example, two firms that supply braking systems to the sector have a combined 75% global market share. Three firms supplying tires. 100% global market share, and so on and on with, with other suppliers to Boeing and Airbus, uh, Airbus, and in other sectors, sector after sector. So the question is, why did global value chains become important and relevant in the World Trade Organization and the Doha Round negotiations in particular? Well, it didn't necessarily have to. It did become uh, uh, important and relevant because a group of um, you know, um, let, let me say, um, academics, uh, thinkers, uh, lobbies, um, mainly from the United States um, and, and Europe, uh, decided um, after the collapse of the 2008 uh, ministerial meeting uh, of WTO uh, negotiators here in Geneva, that, um, you know, the round was dead. And they decided that the round as a whole and all the negotiated texts up to that point were obsolete. And they decided that uh, these forces that I was talking about, you know, that were beginning to form themselves in the 1990s and at the turn of the millennium, they decided that these, this phenomenon of global value chains rendered the negotiating agenda of the Doha round obsolete because the Doha round focused, uh, its principal focus was on agriculture. And then of course, uh, it focused on market access in goods, which is and was the traditional negotiating um, focus of the GATT. And then on services, which became important since the Uruguay round. So this was the, the main part of the agenda of the Doha round. Of course, it had a number of other rules issues uh, in the negotiation, uh, in the negotiating agenda. Uh, but the, uh, uh, this group of people, um, including some you know, important players in the US administration, both from the previous Bush administration and the incoming administration, felt that you know, the Doha round was obsolete it didn't address the newer issues uh, and the, the new trend in the global economy, which was dominated by global value chains. And they said that, uh, according to their analysis, uh, this phenomenon of global value chains um, uh, did not see agriculture and did not, um, or rendered, obsolete the whole negotiating agenda on agriculture because what we were negotiating in agriculture was a reduction of subsidies, tariffs, and other barriers 
that were preventing developing countries from exporting into the north. But these, these people were focused on the lead firms in, in the north, uh, the big multinational companies and what was preoccupying them. What was preoccupying them was how to reduce barriers for their companies uh, throughout the developing world and particularly in the emerging markets. But while the Doha Round prioritized development needs, it also included the needs and priorities of developed countries, too. Is that what was meant by a single undertaking? What, what was that about and what happened there? The single undertaking was a concept we agreed to at the launch of Doha Round, and it meant that all the issues in the Doha Round, uh, a large package of issues, should be taken together and considered together in the overall balance uh, of the negotiation. And they argued that um, this method, this way of negotiating using a single undertaking was obsolete and that um, we should rather focus on issues which were more relevant in the new world economy, ushered in by global value chains. And this new world economy, ushered in by global value chains, privileged trade facilitation and services. And trade facilitation, they argued, was the core issue going forward. Uh, you know, to quote them, uh, one of their papers, they said, this is where the money is. And that's why we need to focus on trade facilitation. And this is indeed why trade facilitation became the issue that the WTO focused on as we went towards the Bali Ministerial Conference. And it is also uh, the reason why you know, a so-called plurilateral form of negotiations emerged in services. Because services was one of the issues, is one of the issues in the Doha round. But the United States um, and uh, other members, uh, mainly in the, in the North, decided that we needed a group of like-minded countries to come together first to, to negotiate a services agreement, a so-called plurilateral agreement amongst a small group of countries. And after they had agreed amongst themselves, then they would come to the rest of the membership. Uh, and because services were so important, they wanted to change the modalities in services, change the way negotiating took place in services. Um, and they wanted to uh, raise the level of ambition. In other words, they wanted to uh, have a higher degree of liberalization and market access uh, in uh, services than the Doha round modalities had provided for. They also argued that uh, developing countries like China, India, Brazil, and even South Africa uh, had risen in the last decade uh, and become more dominant in the world economy, had gained an increasing share of world uh, markets, uh, and therefore, uh, need not be and should not be given uh, you know, any additional policy space um, as they were in the Doha round. And uh, uh, therefore they argued that the modalities, in, the modalities in WTO language means you know, the method by which we decide on uh, tariff reductions and how we distinguish between developed countries and developing countries in um, you know, the different proportion and burden of um, adjustments that each have to make, each and contribution that each has to make to the Doha round. So taking the case of China as a developing country that's risen in dominance in the world economy over the past few decades, according to development expert at the University of Cambridge, Peter Nolan, well, Chinese firms rank highly in Fortune 500, the FT 500. He points out that these rankings can be misleading, that they can mask uh, the weakness of Chinese firms as global competitors, that these rankings are based on very high revenues, profitability, very large market capitalization of China's state-owned enterprises, but that it's been the industrial policy of China over the last 30 years to leverage these uh, state-owned enterprises as, as their national champions, as, as firms that they can turn into world leaders, as globally competitive Chinese firms. 
And yet, according to the analysis of, of, of uh, Peter Nolan, China lacks a, a, a substantial number of globally competitive firms. And he points to what we discussed in part one, this global business revolution, that since then, the competitive landscape for developing countries is far stiffer than it, it, it was uh, for, for developing countries before. And your thoughts on this? Yes, no, I, I think, I mean, the interesting thing about this business revolution was that it was dominated by firms uh, in the North. So yes, we've also seen in the last decade, a very interesting decade for, for me being here in Geneva, uh, because at the time of the, um, uh, the change um, uh, to, in, towards the Doha round, uh, and the launch of the Doha round, China just exceeded to the WTO. And of course, it was also, you know, uh, uh, an interesting uh, moment because when you look at the statistics um, uh, over the last decade, you see the sharp rise uh, of uh, China's participation in the global economy, not only its trade uh, and uh, uh, imports and exports, but also uh, increasing outward investment. Similarly, you know, in, in uh, uh, companies in developing countries like um, India, uh, even South Africa, Brazil, have become real players in the world economy. However, uh, very few of these um, are lead uh, firms. Very few of these firms are really part of the leadership of these global value chains and dominate the world economy in the way that uh, uh, the elite firms in the North, in, in the U.S. in particular, and in Europe do. And more broadly, the developing country perspective? Of course, you know, the, even the idea of global commodity, cha commodity chains was present in many discourse, discourses of developing countries over the last few decades. Antad has been writing about this. Uh, of course, the forms in which this has taken has begun to change, but the phenomenon was out there. And in each case, uh, when this was studied uh, from the point of view of developing countries, uh, you know, developing countries were concerned about how to move up the value chain from the bottom. Because you know, the reality for almost all African countries is that they are at the bottom of the chain. Even South Africa, a relatively more advanced uh, African economy, uh, remains largely a commodity producer and exporter. And uh, in most cases, it is either at the bottom or you know, at the lower end of the global value chains in which it participates. And the objective of developing countries who are at the bottom end is to move up. In other words, to increase their, sh their share of the value, to increase their gains from uh, the, the, the total profitability. And what the evidence shows is that most of the profits and the larger share of the value from these chains, it goes to the lead firms, even though the lead firms are, uh, you know, have a relatively small number of workers um, and professionals who are employed. They tend to be um, highly skilled and they take the, the bulk of the, uh, the, um, the, the value that is obtained from these chains. Developing countries are struggling to move up, uh, to uh, increase their gains, uh, and to do that, they have to adopt different policies. Rather than look at how to improve the transmission of goods and services in and out of their country, and increase uh, reduce transaction costs. Uh, their task is to develop policies to increase the value that they get, uh, to improve the living standards, to improve the uh, the the um, working conditions of workers, um, and to return a larger share of the profits um, and value to the government and societies where um, you know, production is taking place uh, in global value chains. And this may require a mix of policies 
some uh, may need greater liberalization and uh, deregulation but in other cases in other cases we you know these these countries may need to increase protection and to develop regulations uh, which will allow for um, the spreading of uh, production towards and, and services towards a, a wider community. It will enable uh, both the increasing uh, 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 creation of more jobs, but also uh, the increasing number of, um, of uh, more uh, decent jobs and, and a higher standard of living. So there, there, are, there are contrasting you know, policy objectives, but the discourse of, of those proponents of global value chains in the WTO is to blur you know, these differences and to suggest that the interests of the lead firms is the same as you know, that of all developing countries. This is simply not the case. Next up, let's talk about future prospects. Please join us for our next and final segment with Ambassador Ismail, Faisal Ismail. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.